on a volcanic pot of rage. He shot a little old man in his trailer who was unarmed. Then why are so many people in town defending him? There were just people coming out of the woodwork saying, let this kid out of jail. The victim, a leader in his community. He was a pillar of it. He owned his own business. He was involved with the scouting. But hiding a dark secret. I just can't believe that I didn't see the signs. Was he the town predator? I looked over at him and I said, it happened to you, didn't it? Are we supposed to just turn our backs while this guy's going around and raping children? They were doing nothing. Aaron did something. A vigilante or a hero? He said that he wanted him to suffer like the people that he had uh, made suffer for many years. He needed to be stopped. Breaking point. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Everyone has their breaking point, the moment when they can't take it anymore and they do something they never thought themselves capable of. Aaron Vargas knows that all too well. He had struggled with a dark secret since childhood until one February night when he erupted into violence. A man lay dead and a community was forced to weigh one crime against another. As Chris Cuomo first reported in 2010, it would take months to unravel what had caused the tragedy, and even longer to determine if Aaron was truly to blame. At the end of this dark, winding road through the Redwoods, just outside the small seaside town of Fort Bragg, California, a single shot rang out in February 2009. 911, what are you reporting? A frantic call comes in from a woman who says her husband has been shot. Sergeant Greg Van Patten, a detective with the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office, races to the scene. So I received a phone call from the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office dis Dispatch Center. 16, go ahead. And in the call, they relayed to me that a homicide had just occurred in the Fort Bragg area. At this trailer nestled in the woods, sheriffs find 63-year-old Daryl Ray McNeil lying on the floor. Standing nearby is Daryl's wife, Liz. Lead investigator, Dustin Lorenzo. She was extremely emotional, crying, upset. The scene surprisingly contained and immediately odd. McNeil is dead from a 44 caliber shot to the stomach. No signs of struggle or burglary, just an antique ball and cap black powder revolver laid neatly in pieces on a countertop. McNeil's wife, Liz, who made the 911 call, tells investigators 32-year-old Aaron Vargas, a man she's known for decades, is the lone gunman. Her and her husband were watching a movie. They had a knock at the door. Um, Daryl answered the door. During the conversation, she heard Aaron telling Daryl that he'll never do this again to anybody. And then a shot rang out. Daryl fell back into the trailer, and then Aaron entered into the trailer. Aaron, she tells them, is a close family friend. They used to be neighbors when Aaron was just a boy. His best friend, Michael, is Daryl's son. But now Aaron Vargas appears cold-blooded. At one point, uh, Aaron actually uh, got up, walked over to Daryl McNeil as he was lying on the ground, not saying anything after he'd been shot, and actually physically kicked his body. He wanted to stay at the trailer and ensure that Daryl McNeil died. He said that he had uh, gut shot Daryl because he wanted him to suffer like the people that he had uh, made suffer for many years. Then, Liz says, Aaron reveals a horrific secret he'd kept for 20 years. He then proceeded to tell Elizabeth that the reason why he had shot Daryl McNeil was because Daryl had molested him many years uh, before. Aaron flees the trailer, and then the young father and part-time construction worker goes to the home of his parents, Bob and Robin Vargas. I got up and answered the door. He just stood there a couple steps in the doorway. So I looked back at him, and he said that he had shot Daryl and that he wanted to tell me he was sorry and tell me goodbye. Simple as that? Mm-hmm. Did he seem in shock? Definitely. He was, yeah, he was in shock. And I just sat him down and put my arms around his neck. And that's when he told me Daryl had molested him. Aaron tells his parents the abuse started when he was just 11 during a fishing trip with Daryl and his friend Michael. Any question as to whether or not your son was coming up with a story about why he did it? 
No, Aaron's a very honest person. He's not going to make up a story about anything. Being abused is kind of a weird story to tell anyway. Could have come up with a hundred other excuses. It's not something I don't think he ever wanted to tell anybody. The news is stunning. The revelation of the abuse and the sting of betrayal. Daryl, a man they counted as a friend. Daryl McNeil, who owned an appliance store frequented by everyone in town, was seen as an all-around good guy. Known as friendly and social, he volunteered as a big brother and led the local Boy Scout troop. To the Vargas family, he was a kind and generous neighbor. He seemed like a straight-up guy. Trusted part of the community? Right. He, you never heard him cuss. You never see him drink. Never he, saw him angry. Always friendly. I, I, I just can't believe that I didn't see the signs. I, I just can't believe I didn't. You feel that you should have seen this? I do. But the same man now confessing his haunting past is barely recognizable from the son they know. Has your son ever been violent in the past? Do you know him to have a reputation for violence? No. Aaron's a, anyone that knows Aaron will tell you he's a sweetheart. Gunplay is not something that has been in his life as a way of no. expressing anger. No, no, no. So this was an extreme thing for him to do. Very extreme. His parents say Aaron had everything in front of him. A baby girl he adored and a fiance he was preparing to marry in just two weeks. Why, they wondered, had he risked all that? I told him, why didn't you come to me? I hollered at him. I was upset. I said, who's going to raise your daughter? Who's going to take care of her family now? But while the questions behind the mysterious slaying mount, flashing lights of the sheriff's investigators appear at the end of the driveway. A figure in the darkness started to approach uh, the patrol units, and uh, at that time they recognized that it was Aaron. They went ahead and ordered him to the ground uh, and effected an arrest. At the sheriff's office, Aaron, according to investigators, is not nervous. He was cool, calm. He was normal, just like you'd speak to anybody else at 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Investigators smell alcohol on his breath. Aaron, they find out, is heavily intoxicated. I sat down across the table from him and I began reading his rights. You have the right to remain silent. Do you understand? I'm going to use that one. He interrupted me about halfway through and stated he didn't want to talk to me and would like to speak with his attorney. Aaron is booked that night and charged with murder. As he sat inside a county jail, his inner circle of friends and family learn of the shooting and the secret relationship between the two men. Aaron's younger sister, Mindy, gets the call late that night. My mom got on the phone and um, she said that Daryl was dead and that Aaron had just been arrested and that um, Daryl had abused him. Could you believe it? No. That was a total shock. Aaron is probably the kindest most selfless, compassionate person I know. But this wasn't just about childhood abuse. You have to ask yourself, why did the violence happen on that day and in the way that it did? When we come back, a phone call from out of the blue changes everything. This town will never be the same. Stay with us. Vargas, known for his gentle nature, has shot and killed a man considered to be a pillar of the community. He's confessed to the murder, but claims Daryl McNeil had been abusing him since childhood. What really happened between the two men, and what caused Aaron to snap? Here again, Chris Cuomo. It was the kind of headline that rocks a city no matter how big or small. Murder, molestation, a grown man hunts down his abuser. Rumor and speculation spread through the streets, confusion over Aaron Vargas's story and condemnation for his actions. But to the district attorney's office, which charged Aaron with first degree murder carrying a sentence of 50 years to life, this case is cut and dry. The bottom line is the law is, is very clear that when you do this, there have to be ramifications. But Aaron Vargas says killing Daryl was the last thing he ever wanted to happen. Chris, how you doing? Pretty good. Have a seat. He sat down with 2020 to tell his story. 
Do you remember what kind of kid you were? Were you a happy kid? I was a happy kid up until around middle school. That's when I went fishing with my friend and his dad. What happens? Um, a lot of different things happened. That you never expected? Right. What sense did you make of the situation? I'm still trying to make sense of the situation. Aaron says still, because as shocking as it sounds, he says the sexual abuse never ended. Up and through his teens and into his 20s, Vargas says Daryl McNeil used drugs and alcohol and the shame that Aaron felt to keep him under his physical and emotional control. And how often would it be? Maybe a couple times a year. And what happened? On a fishing trip, again, and uh, we were drinking. And uh, I was half asleep, probably almost sleeping, and he kept rubbing my leg, you know, trying to get a hand on my junk. And finally I got mad and I kept telling him, no, stop, don't do it, don't do it. And he kept trying. And How did you see him? Was he your friend? Who was he? He was like a friend. I mean, sometimes he'd be normal. He'd just go fishing. It'd be fine. Nothing would ever happen. And then he'd just have another side of him come out. And what was that other side? How would he change? He would just... Uh, be persuasive and needy and persistent. and He would just wait until you're totally plowed. He'd get you real drunk and try to take advantage of you. And when that moment came where he would put himself on you, you would just zone it out? Sometimes I'd just be like, hey, don't, don't, you know? And he'd just be like, oh, just let me do this to you really quick and then I'll leave you alone. You know, he'd say whatever he could. When he would make sexual advances, when that's where this would go, in your mind, did you feel this is right, this is wrong? I know it's wrong. And then afterwards, how would you feel? Uh, just shameful. Aaron says he used binge drinking even when he wasn't with Daryl as a way to escape the embarrassment. He was arrested on several DUI charges and couldn't hold down a job. Aaron's family saw him struggling too, but never understood why. Everything would seem fine, and he'd have a job, he maybe had a girlfriend, he seemed happy, he had it together, and then all of a sudden it's like his whole life would fall apart. And my family and I would discuss it at times, you know, we would wonder what's going on with Aaron. We've seen a little bit of change in Aaron, you know, when he got in his teens, and we just kind of figured it was his teens. What do you believe now was the reason for his erratic behavior and his struggles? It was Daryl coming into his life. It was a pattern of Aaron getting away from Daryl and Daryl finding him. And um, that's what would cause Aaron's world to just fall apart. Aaron says no matter how hard he tried to keep his distance from Daryl, the cycle of abuse would start again. He'd find my phone number or whatever, no matter where I went. He'd come around my work and whatnot. He'd call almost daily. Were you trying to push him away? Yes. And he wasn't working? No. And what would it do to you emotionally every time he'd show up, every time he'd call? It would just make me tense up. What do you think it was that kept you from protecting yourself from him? What kind of control did he have? Uh, I think I just didn't care about myself. Explain that to me. He just, for some reason, he got to do what he did, and that was that. If somebody came up to you and pushed you in the chest, and you didn't know them and you didn't like it. Yeah, right. They were going to have their hands full, right? But there was something about this man and what he could do to you that made you somewhat powerless? Yeah, I know. It still doesn't make sense to me. Sometimes I guess people can take control over you in ways that you would never imagine. And that control is what McNeil thrived on, according to ABC News consultant and forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Michael Wellner. Why would a grown man continue this kind of relationship? Unrelenting abuse, and it doesn't have to be happening constantly. You take someone who's vulnerable, and you get them formative, and you attach them all through their development, and you get in their DNA. And that's how you have people who, even in adulthood, are doing things totally unacceptable to them, and yet at the same time, they're powerless to break away from it. I think the sexual hook for McNeil it wasn't only about the child, but it was about that sense that I can have someone who's a big, strong adult, and I still have him in the palm of my hand. That is the mindset of the psychological sadist. But why, after 20 years, did Aaron suddenly snap? Because, he says, he had a revelation that McNeil might have a new target. 
his daughter. Seems like he has a plan. Yeah. Aaron was so excited about a baby, and then when he became a father, it was like this whole new side to Aaron that you saw. You know, he's such a great dad, and it was like, wow, this is great. How did becoming a father change you? It made me want to be responsible, want to make myself, you know, the best guy I could be. Aaron says Daryl called asking to babysit. And you feel that she was in danger? I know she was. Because? Just the way he was coming around my house, and I was, there's no doubt in my mind at all. What was the nightmare for you? Oh, if he came around when I wasn't there, that was, he'd, you know, touch my daughter in some funny way when she wasn't being guarded. That wasn't the only thing weighing on Aaron's mind. The biggest catalyst may have been a phone call that came out of the blue from his best friend, Michael, Daryl's son. He was just distraught and he was out of sorts. Michael tells Aaron he believes his father used him to get to his friends. The two men met here with Daryl's stepson, John Clemens. For the first time in their lives, the three grown men open up about their childhood secrets. I hated him. Never forgot about what he was doing to me. John Clemens says the molestation by his stepfather started around age 10 and continued until he was 14 when he decided to stand up to him. I finally realized that what he was doing to me was wrong. I basically told him if he ever touched me again, I would beat the crap out of him. While the two brothers, John and Michael speak, Aaron quietly. I looked over at him and I said, it happened to you, did it? Aaron didn't say anything. He nodded his head, yes. This was the first time you had ever heard that you weren't alone, right? Right. And this would also be the first time that you would ever admit that you were a victim, right? Yes. Aaron says he was in a state of shock for two days after that meeting and finally went fishing to clear his head. He would have a few drinks. A few would turn into many. I decided to go say something to him. And you bring a gun? Yeah. What happened when you knocked on the door? I remember uh, showing him the gun and uh, tell him, listen, I'm not joking. So you're going to stop doing what you're doing and you're not going to hurt anybody anymore. You didn't go there to kill him? No. Why not? After everything he had done, fear of your own kid, you didn't think it was going to stop? It's not up to me to decide someone's fate. That said, he wound up fatally shooting Daryl McNeil. Aaron insists it was an accident, but says he can't remember how it happened. So the gun goes off. What do you do? Did you try to help Daryl? I was more concerned about what was wrong with Liz. Well, you know what was wrong with Liz. You just shot her husband. But why didn't you try to save the man on the floor if you didn't want to kill him? Uh, he just didn't seem important to me at the time. But there was something important about Daryl McNeil's murder, more than Aaron could ever imagine. There were 12 other people who wanted their fingers on that trigger. And there was more. There were more Aarons out there, right? Right. In the eyes of many, Aaron Vargas is about to go from killer to hero. Stay with us. Aaron Vargas has admitted he killed Daryl McNeil. But it soon becomes clear this story doesn't involve just these two men. New allegations are about to surface that'll shock the community. Once again, Chris Cuomo. With Aaron Vargas behind bars charged with murder, investigators and the entire town of Fort Bragg are struggling to grasp his story, that a man named Daryl McNeil had abused him his entire life. Was McNeil really the monster next door? Paul Clark runs the local Century 21 agency where Daryl worked part-time. Hard-working guy. If you ask him to do anything, he'd be there to do it. The neighbors asked, well, you knew, didn't you? And know what? No. I moved here in 1976 uh, and been around and until the day after, never a word. But Aaron's story was about to get a lot more believable. Within days of the arrest, the phone at the Vargas family home starts ringing. The stories on the other end of the line are from men who knew Daryl, confessing that they too had been abused. Now in their 30s and 40s, each had kept the secret for decades. One of the first calls comes from Todd Rowan. What did you think when you heard about the Aaron Vargas situation? There was some relief there. 
Nobody's going to get hurt anymore. Why was it important for you to come forward? The guilt. Of what? Of knowing what this man had done to me. Who was this man? Daryl McNeil. And what had he done to you? Molested me. Sexually molested me. He knew what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing. And I knew it was wrong. That how can something that feels so good be so wrong? Todd was part of the Boy Scout troop led by Daryl within the Fort Bragg Mormon Church. He says the abuse started at age 15 and went on for six years. I didn't develop normally because that preyed upon me. I carried it for a long, long time. And what would he wind up taking from you? My whole life. Mindy Galliani, Aaron Vargas' younger sister, says stories like Todd Rowan's, 12 in all, trickle back to their family. It was hard to believe. Just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, we would find something else out. That something came from inside Daryl's own family. Remember John Clemens, Daryl's stepson, who met with Aaron just three days before the shooting? John's mother and Daryl's ex-wife, Ginny Cotilla, learned of her son's abuse in the early 90s. Enraged, she went straight to the Fort Bragg police. They told me that the statute of limitations was up at that time, and that I would have to find someone that was younger. So that's when I went around and started asking people that we knew if anything had happened to other children. One of those people was Irene Durrigan, the older sister of Jamie Specey, who'd been taken under Daryl's wing as part of the local Big Brothers program. At first I thought maybe she was a vindictive ex-wife. Um, it wasn't until that Jamie came to my house and I asked him point blank. And he broke down and told me what had happened to him. From age 9 until 17, Jamie claimed he had been molested by Daryl on fishing trips. Jamie was the one that was the youngest. And as he got older, his moods changed. He, he, he couldn't deal with life. Irene tried to convince her now 23-year-old brother to go to the police, but he refused. Jamie said, no, I can't. And I was like, why not? And he said, because I don't want to be labeled. But Daryl's ex-wife, Ginny, was determined to collect more evidence. She says she even searched Daryl's home and made a shocking discovery. Nude photos of young men and boys. Who takes a picture of a, a nude male with an erection? You don't do that. You don't do that unless something's wrong, something's going on. Armed with the photos and Jamie Species' name, she returned to the police. I did what you're supposed to do. You go to the law. So I went to the police department with him. You know, I was told it wasn't enough. And the police officer told me I needed to be careful about what I said because I could be sued for slander. Fort Bragg police have told Aaron's attorney there is no record of Ginny's complaint. But that doesn't sit well with Todd Rowan, who did file a report eight years before the shooting. July 24th, 2001, you go to the police. What did the authorities do? They took the report and wanted me to go undercover and befriend one of the kids that was working for him at the time and help them do kind of a sting operation, so to speak. What happened? Um, I, I couldn't do it. Why not? I didn't want to confront him. Um, my stomach would... Uh, almost induced vomiting when I saw him in later years, here, even six, seven, eight years ago. Todd says after he refused, his complaint was dropped. Why do you think nothing was ever done with McNeil in this community? Such a because because he was a pillar of it. He owned his own business. He was involved with the scouting. He was involved with Big Brothers and Big Sisters organization. Wasn't that even more reason to come after somebody that well, sees a when predator? he played the game and he made himself look out to, you, you make yourself out to look this, this grandiose, generous, caring person, they're not going to look at you for a second. If the police had done something, Jamie Species' brother and sister say, Jamie would never have reached his own tragic breaking point. In 2006, when Jamie was 37, 
he came to his brother Richard panicked, saying Daryl was attempting to contact him. He says, you know, this man keeps bothering me. He keeps threatening me. He says, um, you've got all my guns in your safe. I need one of my guns. I should have saw it. It's four days later, he shot himself in the head. I didn't listen. But now the entire community was listening. And one after another, alleged victims of Daryl McNeil were stepping forward. The stories do sound very similar when you read through the declarations. Yeah, they do. What does that mean to you? It means that Daryl had this way of preying on these victims and he had mastered that and he would do it over and over. You know, it's one thing when someone's a pedophile and you uh, can see that they target the young and they target a certain age group and a certain look. But these people were targeted for collection, preying upon the young and holding on to them through their adolescence and into their adulthood. He was very manipulative. He used his home as a place for these kids to come to and get away from mom and dad, you know, take drugs, drink alcohol, party, and do sexual favors. And pretty soon, these kids become unable to do anything. But they had feelings about it, bad feelings, angry feelings, but they kept them under control. And he softened those feelings in very positive ways. And that was part of how he groomed and manipulated these victims even after they became men. First, Daryl's secret web of abuse. Now, the missed opportunities by police. This is Mindy Galliani. Mindy takes the outrage public. About the radio program. Any t-shirt orders? From protests and petitions to media appearances and fundraising, the single mother's grassroots campaign to tell her brother's story takes off. Tom Hudson, Aaron's defense attorney, couldn't believe it. The community just stood right up. And next thing you know, the, the family and their friends are out on the corner with signs and people are coming over to them. I've never seen it before. They were just people coming out of the woodwork. They were saying, let this kid out of jail. They don't think he should have to serve a prison time, that he's suffered enough in, 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 in his life that he needs to be able to have his own family and be able to heal. And I think the community, after realizing the number of young men that have come, come forward, they're in support of him. They don't think he should be a victim any longer. A town once skeptical is now, it appears, backing a murderer. But not everyone in Fort Bragg is ready to parade Aaron through the streets. There is always two sides of a story, and there is another side to the story, for sure. What was the relationship between these two men really about? That's next. Aaron Vargas has confessed to killing Daryl McNeil. Other men have come forward with new allegations that they too were abused by McNeil. And many in the community are taking Aaron's side. But so far, that argument doesn't sway prosecutors from building a case for murder. Once again, Chris Cuomo. A town up in arms calling for the release of a killer in the name of rough justice against an alleged child molester. But do they know the whole story? It's much more involved than what uh, is led to believe uh, in previous media reportings. It's been one-sided. Sergeant Greg Van Patten, who investigated the case, says Aaron's story of abuse doesn't line up with his actions. We received information that potentially uh, Daryl McNeil and Aaron Vargas were engaged in a consensual adult relationship approximately two to four years uh, before his death, that they both engaged in this relationship. Was this, they wondered, just a lover's quarrel? Did it sour at one point because of the molestation or did it sour because of other issues within that relationship? I hear that a 20-something-year-old is having some kind of friendship slash sexual relationship with another man. What do I think? You think he's a You think he's gay. You think it's consensual. Right. Because it usually is, right? Yeah. Was this consensual? No. And as you got older and there was still a sexual component to the relationship, at any point, was that something that you just wanted? No. Never? Never. Do you understand how that could be hard to understand for somebody? Yes, I do. And why? Why is it tough to understand? 
Because it seems like you'd be able to stand up for yourself and just get away from the person altogether. If you wanted. Right. But nothing, investigators say, made sense in Aaron's story of that night. To them, this was no accidental shooting. He formulated the intent. He brought a loaded gun with him. He drove approximately 3.8 miles from his residence to Daryl McNeil's residence. He knocked on the door, made a statement to McNeil to the effect of, you will never hurt anybody ever again, and killed Daryl McNeil. This was a planned event. He executed what he planned to do, drove away, went to his parents' house and, and waited for law enforcement to show up. He turned himself in and he was willing to roll the dice to, to see what happened to him. Assistant District Attorney Beth Norman says statements made by the only witness, McNeil's wife Liz, led to only one conclusion. Aaron was there that night to take Daryl down. And she's real clear that, that as he lay dying there, she had her cell phone. She wanted to call for help. And he was real clear, no, you don't do that. Did Aaron seem remorseful, like this was an accident? Oops, I'm sorry. Not at all. Not at all. Did it seem to her that this is what he wanted to have happen? Yes. And she recalls him very clearly saying he was glad he did it. He was glad he gut shot him. He was glad that he was suffering. She recalls him at one point in time kicking Daryl while Daryl was laying there dying. The word vigilante they put on him, somebody who has taken the law into his own hands. Mm -hmm. Does that fit here? I think it does. I really do. Because I've always felt right is right and wrong is wrong. And he was pushed in a corner. Now, the part of that word that you don't like, Robin, is that you th don't think it fits I don't think he consciously made a decision to take this into his own hands. I think he just mentally broke because he was pushed so hard by Daryl, he would not leave him alone. Aaron's defense attorney says the prosecution was overzealous. There was pretty no excuse to have to charge that as a first degree murder. It, it was obvious from the night from February 8th and the morning of February 9th that Aaron was there to see McNeil because McNeil had molested him and molested other people. And he was afraid he would molest his daughter and continue molesting young people in the community. Dr. Michael Wellner agrees. He made no effort to avoid being detected. And that is what you see in someone who actually does snap. Wellner believes Aaron now knew the power of the puppet master that had controlled his life, and none was beyond his reach. You ever heard of a situation like this before where a man has another man having this kind of physical and emotional control over them for this much of their life? I haven't heard of a situation like this, but having heard about it, I reflect on whether the reason I haven't heard about it is that the McNeils of the world are just so good at it that we never find out. What do you think the impact was for Aaron Vargas of meeting the other men who came forward with the same type of horror story that he had lived? I think that conversation was a catalyst. I think there was something about taking in the story of these other victims that heightened for him his own helplessness, the scope and success, really, of McNeil's preying on others and underlined the urgency of the threat to Vargas's daughter. And he wasn't strong enough to do something for himself, but when it came to his kid, that extra motivation, that extra fear, put him in a condition where he could act. Think about it as a father. What would you do for a kid? Anybody who's been a parent can relate to that. Would you die for your child? Hell yeah. A psychologically tortured defendant, a town asking for his release. The case against Aaron Vargas is turning into a public relations nightmare for the prosecution. What did you think about how the community took a turn toward Aaron Vargas in this situation? That was difficult for us. I mean, we had to keep going forward because we know legally what we have to do. And there's an even bigger problem. Some members of Daryl's own family seem to support Aaron Vargas. In this letter to the district attorney, even the widow who witnessed the execution asks for the case to be settled. She misses her husband, and she is not happy that he's not around, though she understands how it all played out. She thinks the most important thing for Aaron would be to get counseling and then try and make a happy life for himself. Were you surprised when people with the name McNeil and who were related to Daryl McNeil came forward and said, I know what he did. I know why Aaron did this. I support Aaron. 
I wasn't surprised by that. I assumed that that's what would happen from the beginning. Why? Because I know how well they know Aaron. Aaron grew up around them. What do you think is going to happen? I'm hoping that we get a jury that we can educate on all these psychological issues, a jury that's compassionate, that doesn't just see these issues in black and white. Um, and I'm hoping that they'll see that the right thing to do is to, to let Aaron get help. What is right in this situation? What is the right thing to do here? Aaron needs to be home. He needs to be in counseling. He needs to be with his family. He doesn't need to be locked up. It's not his fault. But how would a jury see Aaron? As a father desperate to protect his family from the nightmare he endured? Or as a calculating killer who took things too far? Stay with us. More than a year has passed since Aaron Vargas' arrest for murder. Soon, a jury will have to decide. Is he a vengeful vigilante who gunned down Daryl McNeil in a calculated rage? Or a young man in the grip of a sadistic predator who pushed him to the edge? As Chris Cuomo reported, Aaron's family can only hope that the jury will see the same person they do. So what do you want people to know about your brother? Because the headline reads, man murders a man that he says was his abuser 20 years ago. I want them to know that Aaron was just trying to get somebody to leave his family and other people alone. He was just trying to scare somebody into not abusing kids anymore. You don't think it's premeditated murder? Not at all. If it was premeditated murder, Aaron would have took him out on a fishing boat out on the ocean. And it would have been an accident. He's. 20 years of abuse went by and, and he didn't try and seek vengeance on this man. He's not a vengeful person. He didn't go over there with the intent for somebody to die. What is the hardest part for you emotionally in seeing your brother in jail and thinking about what might happen to him? That he doesn't deserve it. If it's the case that Aaron was right about everything and Daryl was threatening, we're not supposed to take the law into our own hands. What else right? are you supposed to do when the system fails to protect you, what other choice do you have? Are we supposed to just turn our backs while this guy's going around and raping children? The people who were supposed to be protecting Aaron and these other kids, they were doing nothing, and Aaron did something. We don't feel that it is right for Aaron Vargas to have come to the decision that he is the judge, the jury, and the executioner when it comes to Daryl McNeil. With feelings so hot in the small town, prosecutors decide getting 12 impartial jurors is a long shot. They drop the first degree murder charge and offer Aaron an 11th hour plea deal, voluntary manslaughter, avoiding a life sentence. We allowed him to plead to the manslaughter because we believe his past affected his mindset on that night. This was a solid middle resolution for us. And, and I think it's something that the jury, 12 people, all 12 would have been comfortable with. Suddenly, all of the anxiety, all of the frenzied efforts to prepare for trial were over. But the questions a jury might have answered remain. I think everybody's been victimized at one point in their life. And at, at one point, are we going to say that it's acceptable for you to go out there and take another person's life? because of, of something bad that's happened to you. And there is a criminal justice system. There's a reason why there is a criminal justice system. So I wouldn't call him a hero, um, but that's just me personally. You see yourself as a hero? No. Are you a vigilante? No. Just somebody that wanted a guy to stop. He couldn't be stopped. You really believe he could not have been stopped any other way? Not unless the police would have arrested him. You didn't give him the chance, though, did you? I had, they had plenty of chances. So do you believe you belong here? No. Why not? Because if the law doesn't work, it, it doesn't work. Why you? Why do you get to decide just because the system's broken? The system you did not go to, by the way. Right. Why do you get to say, well, the system's broken, so I had to do it? Well, like I said, I didn't go there to shoot the guy. I went there to warn him off. But you wound up shooting him. Yeah. Do you regret it? Did you feel like this needed to be done? 
he needed to stop. That's for sure. He didn't need to be shot and killed, but he needed to be stopped. He was actually damaging people, and it wasn't a game anymore, you know? He played his whole life like it was a game. He just wasn't going to keep going, and we weren't going to be little puppets anymore. He could receive up to 10 years in prison, or he could walk away a free man. Whenever Aaron is released, Fort Bragg will likely welcome home a controversial hero. When that boy gets out, I'm going up and shake his hand. I'm going to give him a big hug and tell him if there's anything I can do for him the rest of his life, I'll be there for him. I don't want to praise Aaron for what he did, but Aaron did what he felt was right to save himself. He's still alive. He can go through therapy. He can get the help he needs. My brother's not alive. And all I have is memory. I'm sorry. All I have is memories of Jamie. Some still feel Aaron should have faced a jury of his peers. There's no one that's for sexual abuse. Absolutely no one. No one would ever say that. But the fact that uh, Daryl was murdered without his day in court uh, doesn't set well with a lot of people. How should Aaron Vargas be seen? Is he a hero? No. What is he? I think he's somebody who acted out without thinking. He took a loaded gun and shot a little old man in his trailer who was unarmed. I don't know how that's a hero. Aaron's sister Mindy doesn't see her brother's plea deal or sentencing as an ending, good or bad. To her, this is just the beginning of a long road to recovery. Daryl got off easy because his victims are still here and all their families are still here. And there's a lot of pain that's still going mm -hmm. on. It's just something that they'll have to deal with for the rest of their lives. I think he got off easy. We're having to deal with his mess. Aaron Vargas was sentenced to nine years in prison. He unsuccessfully appealed that sentence and is scheduled to be released in 2017. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of...